I have been coming to terms with the fact recently that I'm um, a very just conceptual person. I, I just really like big ideas. Um, I like thinking about big stuff. And I had written this very ambitious message to give to you guys. Um, and it was huge. And there were all these just haymakers of, of one-liners and just great scripture and stuff. And I was like, no, we're not going to do that one tonight. We're going we're gonna to really break one thing down. Um, which I think is really important, um, and I think I say this every time I speak, anytime I speak at the church, I talk about how important I think our biblical grammar is, how important it is that we're on the same page with the words that are used in the Bible, that we're able to use them the same way, that we're able to understand them the same way, because really, there is quite a large communication breakdown in a lot of our terms, right? Um, I think something that we're going to go over tonight um, there's a big gap in it. Um, so one more just kind of prep thing. Um, if you brought a Bible and you want to follow along, we are going to be um, in only four places. Um, the first place that we're going to be, and kind of the main place that we're going to stick around, uh, we're going to end with this too, is going to be Revelation 5. Um, other places we're going to be tonight, Exodus 11 and 12, Leviticus 1, and Malachi 1. If someone said that to me, I'd be like, yeah, whatever. I'm just going to follow you as you go. <laughs> but I was like, maybe there's some, like, really ambitious person who has bookmarks, and they've always waited for someone to say that. Um, okay, so got that out of the way. Let me pray, and we'll get started. Lord, um, I just invite you here. Lord, I know we were doing that with our worship. I know. A lot of us think of this place, and we expect you to be here. But Holy Spirit, I invite you here, Lord, particularly into the places that, um, that we don't maybe want to let you go, those kind of dark or bitter or hurt places in our lives, in our mind. Lord, I invite you into all those places. Do your work here tonight. Minister to us through your word. Help us grow closer to you. Help us to be more like you, Jesus. In your wonderful name, amen. All right. Um, we're going to be talking about one phrase tonight, and this is in Revelation 5, like I said, and that phrase is this phrase, worthy is the lamb who is slain. Um, probably heard that phrase before, it's in a handful of worship songs, uh, we talk about it, big phrase at Easter. Where does it come from? Um, this scripture right here is uh, kind of what gave it those songs a lot of the time, or what uh, made those songs those songs. So this is um, kind of halfway through Revelation 5. Um, I'm just going to start at verse 9. Um, you don't have to read along, but I encourage you to do so. And it says this, And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God, from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. And then I looked, and I heard around the throne, and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who is slain. To receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. All right, so John, our author of Revelation, is saying that the angels sung this new song or this, this song before. Um, I think the song was, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord God Almighty. Right, but he says he saw this vision and the angels sang this new song. And part of this new song was, Worthy is the Lamb who is slain. And what I just want to get into is um, when I first started thinking about this, it was around Easter last year, I realized that means something so different to me than what it meant to the Israelites. When I think of a lamb, I think of a barbecued meat that I don't like very much. Um, no matter how much stuff you put on it or mint you put on it or whatever, um, I just can't get lamb to taste good. I don't like it. That's what I think of when I hear the word lamb, right? But this was a really powerful phrase to God's people. This has a lot of roots in biblical history. Um, 
it's very symbolic. It's very powerful. It's not just this flippant phrase that um, if you're just kind of dumb and ignorant like me, you think of roasted meats, right? We first see some measure of sacrifice with Cain and Abel in Genesis, right? We go on a little bit further. We see with Abraham and Isaac and them both being so grateful for this ram that showed up and gave its life for them, right? And we go on a little further to where I want to hang out for a while. Um, And I want to paint this out for you guys. I want to put you in these people's shoes. So picture this. Let's, uh, let's pretend you're a little younger. Let's pretend you're a teenager again. Some of you don't have to pretend. <laughs> you're still in your teens. But pretend you're like the cool teenager, like when you're 12, 13. And you've had the worst week of your life. It all started when this guy came out of the desert And he started prophesying about stuff and asking that your people would be set free. And he said that the rivers were going to turn to blood, and they did. And he said there was going to be a plague of gnats and a plague of lice and a plague of frogs, and you hate all of those things, right? And it's it's disgusting. There's dead fish. It stinks because the river turned to blood. There's frogs and all kinds of just horrible insects everywhere. There's a curse that's put on livestock, and they're all dying, and the stench is just becoming unbearable. These animals that you have cultivated, that you have tried to bring up to sell at the market or whatever it might be, are dead. You get to see this strange uh, thing, these rocks falling from the sky that are very cold. You've never seen that before. He says that it's going to be dark when it should be day, and it happens. And everything is just in chaos. There is death. There is misery. People you know are being sick and stricken with boils. And this guy predicted all of these things. He said, if Pharaoh didn't do what he said, all of these things were going to happen, and each one got crazier and crazier, and it kept happening. And you kept thinking, there's no way that's going to happen, and it did. And finally, you hear through the grapevine, you weren't at this meeting, your parents weren't at this meeting, but you hear there's one last plague, one last curse. And this one is that the firstborn in every family is going to die tonight at midnight. And you are not the firstborn that your older brother or sister is. Right? And you, don't, you didn't hear really all of the, the stipulation. You didn't really hear all of what's going on. You don't know if, if firstborn also means uh, your dad, who was the firstborn in his family, or your grandpa, who was the firstborn in his family. You heard someone talk about all the livestock and all the slaves. There's no exception to this. All you know is this guy who's prophesied these insane things said that every firstborn would die tonight. But you heard that he was also told that if you find a lamb, an unblemished lamb, a perfect lamb, about a year old, and you kill it, and you slaughter it and take some of its blood, and you eat it in this really strange way, and you paint its blood over your door, that your family would be spared. And you get the lamb... Your father spent hours trying to find this thing. And you're crying because your older brother or sister's going to die, right? You don't know. You guys are all confused. Your mom's freaking out. And you guys are just hoping that you did this right. And I want to ask you, what else are you feeling in this moment? And this this isn't a rhetorical question. I want to hear what you guys think. What are you feeling? What's going on in your head? What's going through your mind? What are you thinking? forgot about this. (laughs) Forgot you guys don't talk. This is so fun with junior hires. I am, uh, I'm probably not sleeping, honestly. 
It's probably the worst day of my life. I'm terrified. Did you want to say something? What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, I would be terrified. Um, And I think it was probably like this for a lot of people. I, I genuinely think a lot of people didn't know exactly what was said. And that's what I would be questioning. I'd be thinking, how do I find out who is at this? Who can remember exactly what was going on? Because this is life or death. I I care about my family. This isn't something that I want to risk, right? Something else that I'd be thinking about, I'd be stressing about is, was the lamb perfect? Was there a better lamb that I could find? Could I have spent more money to find a better lamb? I pray to God that this lamb is good enough, right? Right? And the night goes on, and you do all the stuff, and you paint the door. And like I said, you're hoping that it's going to work. <clears throat> and come midnight, however it is people told time back then, you start to hear the worst noise you've ever heard. And it is a chorus of moans and cries and sobs going out all over the city. It is all of the people who didn't do this, losing family members, losing sons and daughters, wives, husbands, uncles. And you are so grateful. You are so grateful that that lamb was worthy. Right? You know, this phrase meant something so different to those people. Right? It's amazing because God goes on to further miraculously demonstrate his power and save the Israelites. Right? We go on, uh, Pharaoh, if you haven't read, you should read. Spoiler alert, though. Um, He goes and he finally sets God's people free. Right, And then he chases them, and God parts the sea, and they're like, oh my goodness, I didn't even know that I could know that you couldn't do this. right? And they go through the sea, Pharaoh's army gets swallowed up, they're, fo- they're following a-, a pillar of fire, they're getting fed like manna from the sky. It's incredible, right? This God is incredible, and you fear him. You're going to do what he says. And if we jump to Leviticus... Um, Leviticus 1, oh, that's not a calendar. Um, Verse 3, we see them start to talk about burnt offerings. It says this, if his offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he shall offer a male without blemish. He shall bring it to the entrance of the tent of the meeting, and he may be accepted before the Lord. And he shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted to make atonement for him. And if you read Leviticus, it goes into talking about a bunch of different ways to have these offerings for your sin, right? For messing up. And I want to highlight again, it, it uses this term, without blemish. Without blemish. And I want to ask you this, this time you don't have to answer, but does God need sacrifice? Is God up there with this like big bowl and he just needs, like, innocent goat blood, innocent lamb blood. No, right? And he doesn't need it to be perfect. The sacrifice isn't for God. It's for you and me. It was for them. It being without blemish is for us for some reason. Why is that important? I have a couple answers. First one, um, it's, it being without blemish, it's not casual, Right? It's not a common thing. This is a more rare animal. Right? It's something weighty. It's something, um, in fact, so rare, and it's something so weighty, so important to you, so important to these people, that it's kind of a filter that you would start to live your life by. Um, I don't know if any of you guys are car people, but when you see, like, very nice cars, it stands out, right? Because you've educated yourself on it. Maybe some of you guys are shoe people, or um, I don't know what you like. Right? What stands out to you? What uh, filters do you kind of see the people in the world around you? God's people 
would notice a perfect lamb, an unblemished lamb, and they'd see it. They'd think about that, right? That's a perfect lamb. Next time I sin, I'm going to come to this guy for that lamb, right? Because it's not a casual thing. It's not a common thing. Uh, Second, why is it important that it's without blemish? This is traditionally going to be your best animal, right? I don't know about you, but especially on that night of Passover, if um, I have the option of like three lambs, and they're all like technically unblemished, right? Uh, One has like almost no mange, a little bit of mange, almost none. One is like a little bit blind in one eye, and one is perfect. I am not risking it by choosing one of the lesser of the two, right? I'm giving my best. I'm sacrificing the best that I have to offer, right? I think about this. um, If you don't know me, I'm really into pets. I, I have several lizards. I've spent a lot of money on lizards. Um, I've researched a lot about lizard breeding, um, and... If you have a trait, if there's something that you like in an animal, a color or a, a whatever, um, you selectively breed that animal, right? Your perfect lambs would be the ones, if you want to make more perfect lambs, guess, guess which ones you should save? Your unblemished lambs, right? But God says, those are the ones that I want, creating this kind of crazy lamb economy, Right, where lambs, these unblemished lambs are getting rarer and rarer and rarer. That word sounds funny. Right, you could game it, you could save them, you could be like, I I got this whole thing figured out, I'm going to make the perfect lamb. But that's not how God laid it out. Right, you were to give your best. Uh, Next point that lamb had no need to die right like i pointed out no mange no blindness um (laughs) can't say that um yeah it was a perfect lamb right this lamb in fact if you let this lamb live with 10 other lambs that lamb is probably going to live the longest because it's the healthiest right that lamb is actually probably the furthest from death of anything right There's no reason for you to kill this animal early. You should, like I said, leave it around to multiply. And the last point, why it's relevant if it's perfect or not, this lamb's perfection and then subsequent death highlight how terrible sin is, how disgusting, how just, how weighty it is right? This is a perfect, innocent, young animal. And sacrifice is, it's a terrible thing, right? If you read on in Leviticus, um, some of the ways that you did things are extremely gory, right? Spewing the intestines and innards all over and slicing things open. And it's this smelly, bloody, uh, the sounds that these animals are probably making are just terrible, right? And this animal's perfection, like I said, highlights how awful sin is. You are forced to face the fact that decisions that you have made have caused this, this little creature to die, to suffer. This is the consequence of your sin, right? Of you choosing to separate from God, you choosing to do things your way. And if you want to be right with God, this is what it requires. Like I said, a worthy lamb wasn't a common thing. It was innocent. And everyone recognized it as the symbol of forgiveness from God. Right? A worthy lamb was an extremely different thing to God's people. 
Moving on. Furthering our study of lambs and sacrifice. Uh, Malachi 1. Don't worry, I'll turn there. Um, I need to say anything first. Nothing at all. Let me read you something. Um, jump down to verse 6. The priest polluted offerings. A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? If I am a master, where is my fear, says the Lord of hosts to you? O priests who have despised my name, but you say, how have we despised your name? By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, how have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals and sacrifice, is that not an evil thing? Jumping down a little bit, I think, to the end of verse 10. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts. I will not accept an offering from your hand. And jumping to the end of chapter 1. Cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it, yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. God rescinds his deal he made with God, with his people, about the offerings, about the sacrifices, right? He goes back on it. He's like, you know what? It, this doesn't work anymore. This, this wasn't some sort of gumball machine deal, right? Where they sacrifice the lamb, they get the gumball, they get the forgiveness, whatever it is, right? I think about um, these kind of people doing this and hearing this from Malachi and saying, what are you talking about? We're doing technically what you said. And like I said earlier, God isn't after the death of lambs. He's not after the slaughtering of of animals, right? He's after the same thing he's always been after, which is hearts. God knew and knows that when we sacrifice in the right way, with the right heart, that it is good for you and I. It brings us closer to him. It should, right? Like I said, he doesn't need our burnt offerings, but God wants your heart, and he's going to do what he can to get it. You know, I think in Malachi, these priests probably looked like pretty good Jewish people, pretty good Israelites, Right? They probably knew the Bible very well, probably better than most of us. They probably went to church a bunch of times a week. They probably knew all the worship songs. They were probably really good at praying. They probably grew up in the church. Right? But their hearts were off. And the sacrifices that were made were not accepted by God. I think it's a lot like someone saying that they accept Jesus as their Savior, but they're not saved, right? Their heart is wrong. It is off in this. Um, I want to go back to Revelation 5, and this is where we'll end. And I want to read this to you guys again. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll, to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God, from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom, and priests to our God, and they shall reign on earth. And then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who is slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory 
and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. You see, this is an important phrase to understand. Because this is a song that is sung in heaven. That is sung for eternity. Right? And if um, you don't know the Bible very well, Jesus is that lamb. Jesus is the worthy lamb. Right? He was perfect. He was innocent, undeserving of death. All of those things that we talked about with the lamb. The thing that was furthest from dying. The thing that needed to die the least. The one that highlighted how terrible sin is the most. Jesus was all of that. Right? And he humbled himself to death on a cross for us. I think it's really easy to lose sight of how evil sin is. And I think it's a really dangerous thing. Um, I think it's a really terrible thing to forget this, to neglect this. I think it's, it's a terrible thing that something like this, that songs like this are only sung around Easter because this is something that we should never forget. Right? Um, now, I want to go back over the story in Egypt. Um, but I want the band to come up. Is the band in here? Can you guys come up here? Give them a second. I know, I'm really shaky. I've always been. I want to take you guys back to Egypt. I want to put you back in that place. Right? You've had a crazy couple days. Can you guys turn the lights down a little bit? And it is a very serious time. Because this time, it's not your brother. It's not your sister. It's not Arcadia. It's my daughter. It's not your mom. It's not your dad. It's not the family next to you who's going to die. It's you. And come midnight tonight, your life will end. You're probably a little worried. You're probably a little panicked, frantic even. And you are searching and searching for that lamb. You are looking and you find one and it's, it's not good enough. This will not work, right? And you find another and another and they're all getting taken and you just can't find one. And the time is coming closer. It's getting darker. And just as you're entering your final moments, a man raises his hand and he says, I will take your place. And you know this man. And this is a man who has only ever shown you love. This is the best man you've ever met. This is the man, if you had to pick someone who mostly didn't deserve to die for you, the person who, who shouldn't die, the person you should die for, it's him. And you think about that and you say, no, I will not let you take my place. I don't accept you. And he says, it's already finished. This is done whether or not you accept this. And you get to live the rest of your life figuring that out. And he dies for you. And you live. Because he is worthy. Right? He is 
is the only one who ever could have. You couldn't do it. You weren't going to find the lamb to cover you like he did. Are you going to remember him as you get older? As you get farther and farther away from Passover, you know, you celebrate it. Your life was spared. But it gets fuzzier. It gets further away. Are you going to remember that? What did his death mean in your life? Do you have anything to show for it? Where's your heart drifted in regard to him? Where are you more like the priests in Malachi? I think it would be a shame if that happened and you forgot that. I think it would be a shame for you to only remember that once or twice a year. And I think that's something you should think about a lot. I think that's something that should never get old. I think that phrase, worthy is the lamb, is something that that should never tarnish I said it's a song that's sung in heaven it's an eternal song something that will always be true and I'm going to end but I want to say um, I started this off talking to you about how I, I love big ideas and, and these big conceptual things but even more than that I love the idea of just helping people to love Jesus of helping people to remember Jesus you know, like I said, it would be a terrible thing if all that was true and if you forgot it. And it's a terrible thing if that's true and there are so many other people who will never hear it. Right? They will live in that moment of midnight their whole life. Death will always be upon them. And no one's going to tell them someone already paid the price whether or not they accept it, right? These are things you should think about, things we should pray about, things we should remind each other of. These are the, the things, like I said, that are eternally important. I'm going to pray, and we're going to worship. mention how your people's hearts can grow hard as stone and you wish to turn them into that heart of flesh again. That soft heart that is malleable to you. A heart that is open to your conviction, that is open to your leading. And Lord, we lay our hearts out before you, Lord. All of us who have those wounds, who have those scars, those calluses on our heart where it's, it's hard to feel anything right there. Lord, we have parts of our life towards you that are numb. Lord, we lay those things down before you. Lord, those of us who have grown numb to what you did for us, Jesus. Lord, those of us who forget the significance of communion. Lord, those of us who, who don't remember you this time of year. Lord, those of us who, who forget what you did. us to remember. Lord, help us to make it something that we never forget. We love you, Lord. You are worthy. Thank you, Jesus.